Good afternoon, class. Lots to do today, last day here and how things work. So I want to go ahead. Yeah, I think there's already applause. OK. Um, I'd like to go ahead and get started. When we left last, what, Friday, we were talking about the Large Hadron Collider. I want to finish talking about that today. Then after we wrap up the Large Hadron Collider, hopefully you'll have time to talk about why there's a fish tank looking thing up there full of mouse traps. And then uh, we'll wrap it up. We'll call it a semester. Um, so back to the Large Hadron Collider. One of the things I like about science these days is it's pretty open source. There's a lot of collaboration. Uh, CERN itself is situated in Geneva. It straddles the Franco-Swiss border. So right there, the experiment itself does not belong to any particular country. It, just the physical plant of the, of the experiment is half in one country, half in another. And when you go to CERN, which everyone should do, and when you go to CERN, there are scientists from just about every country on the planet they're working. And they're guys from Afghanistan working side by side from guys from Pakistan. And they're all having lunch together. And the CERN cafeteria is just this big <coughs> melting pot, I guess I'll say. It's just, uh, it's just it's an impressive place to go to see the amount of collaboration there. Um, and it's also very open. They're very open source. They're very uh, free with their data. In fact, here's a picture of the C Here's a live shot of the CMS control room. So let's see, uh, they are, what, six, five hours ahead of us. So there's, a, there's some guy, not doing a whole lot right now because it's probably dinner time over there. But um, there's a live shot of, what, of the CMS control center. I mentioned last class, there's four main experiments at CERN. CMS is one of the big ones. CMS is one of the experiments that UVA has actually had a, a big uh, role in constructing that device and collecting data there. Also, uh, if you want, I think I have this here. If you want, you can kind of sit in on their, on their meetings. And so here's the PowerPoint from last Friday. And so if you wanted to keep abreast of the machine's status, they have a daily meeting where, in this case, E. Bravin and his buddy or her buddy uh, gave a daily beam commissioning meeting. There it is on Friday, April 29th. That's the daily beam commissioning meeting. I think that's an important one. So I think we would all want to kind of get in on that meeting. You can be a fly on the wall. You can download the PowerPoint and watch it. Uh, here's why that's relevant to us. So um, I, I love that. So here's the, this is, this is CERN. This is like the biggest science experiment ever made. This is where real huge science that's per, like moving our, our species forward is happening and they start off with well the good news is we did get stable beams you can see there we've got six TeV of beam that's good um, the rest of that that's slide three I think there's maybe 30 slides or so slide three is the good news the other 27 slides are the not as good news um, and so they talk about the uh, summary of the last 24 hours I think you can read that um, they did a recovery, then they injected the pilot beams, and they did an injection of the steering, and then the fast beam something transformer phasing. That's awesome. Then they got about seven hours of stable beams, and then severe electrical perturbation. Um, that came up last class. So I'm glad last class someone was Googling while I was talking and, and let us know that that was going on. So that was going on like while we, let's see, 5.30 uh, their time. So maybe that was a couple hours before class. So um, the severe electrical perturbation. If you scroll down, if you, if you go down through their slides, yeah, not the best week for the LHC. So this is, this is the official PowerPoint coming from CERN. Um, there it is in point, point eight, point eight of the, I don't even remember what that, engineering, uh, that's cooling and the ventilation, I think. So down in the cooling and ventilation, down at point eight. Let's see, recovery. So this is, these are actually several things going on. Then, they, then we get to the electrical perturbation, blah, 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 affected all accelerators. Fortunately, just about all the magnets did their fast abort. And I mentioned last uh, class, and I, I, when I mentioned this last class, the copper bars in the ceiling, it's crazy that at, probably as I was talking about them, they were being used. And they're supposed to never be used. It's kind of like the third, the third prong in your socket. It's not supposed to be used, but it's nice if you have a short, you've got an emergency route to ground. So in earth fault, so uh, earth and ground are often used synonymously. So when we say, uh, that circuit is grounded. Sometimes there's a ground fault or an earth fault, meaning some, some high current that was supposed to be going one place ended up going to ground. And then if you scroll down, cause, short circuit caused by a fouine. Anyone speak French? Fouine? Uh, quel 
as Fween. Hell, a Fween. Um, I googled it. It means weasel. So uh, there's, there was a weasel, apparently, at CERN who brought the whole thing down. The poor weasel didn't make it. Um, he was subjected to 66,000 volts, which, given the average resistance of a weasel, 66,000 divided by, probably like a couple hundred amps of current was not good for him. So, um, and then they, they go on to say, uh, yeah, so actually, yeah, if you were to go right now to the, the CERN, there's all, you can look at their data. They've all got, it all says things like no beam. In fact, we could even go there. Yeah, we can go there now, right now. So here's a live shot of data coming from CERN. The, down in the bottom left, that's the cryogenics. They're all red because they're all shut down. Um, let's see if we go straight to the main page. 0.8 transformer repair going on. No beam before Friday. Next step, data as soon as possible. So till Friday, that's, that's a whole week of downtime. Um, due to uh, a weasel. So that's, that's what's going on at CERN right now. So s smartest men and women on the planet, I'm pretty sure, couldn't figure out um, how to keep weasels out, I suppose. I don't know. Um, one of my other students today said they probably didn't account for the standard deviation of weasels, weasel size, and maybe they didn't, uh, maybe the weasel got in where they didn't think the weasel would get in, a little small one, I don't know. Okay, so let's uh, finish up talking about the Large Hadron Collider. So there it is. 17 miles around, 100 meters underground, four main experiments. So you can see, uh, you can see there's a sort of a penultimate ring on the left. That's the super proton synchrotron. And CERN's really good at uh, recycling. What they do is they, they built like the b best accelerator ever. And then when they wanted to upgrade it, they just made that the lead in stage to the next one. And so then, then the next one was the biggest accelerator ever until that became just the lead-in stage to a bigger one. And so right now, there on the left, that was the largest accelerator on the planet for a long time. And now it's just the feed-in for the Large Hadron Collider, which is 17 miles around. So it sends these two counter-rotating beams of protons into collision. I just want to get into 10 minutes of detail about how that happens, sort of. Let's pull up some more pictures. Um, there's the beam pipe. So if you're ever, to, like I said, if you're ever to go to CERN, everyone should. You might have access down to the cavern. So that, that picture right there is 100 meters underground. That beam pipe is, I don't know, like four or five feet around, four or five feet in diameter. And that contains the beam. Now, I mentioned last class, the beam is actually about the size of a pencil. The reason I need a five foot diameter tube for two beams, well, the beam pipe is the diameter of the pencil. The beam itself, I mean, it's protons. It's unfathomably small. But the reason I need a, a, such a, something that big is because of my superconducting magnets. So pretty much the entire 17 miles of the Large Hadron Collider is superconducting magnets. And that is a lot of the energy and expense and engineering difficulty that went into it. And so today I want to talk a little bit about why you need magnets, why we use superconducting magnets, how do you get the protons in there, and then we'll be done with that. Um, so let's see, here's another diagram of the CERN Accelerator Complex. So again. CERN is the big Center for European Research Nuclear. It's a European French acronym, I think. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a whole series of experiments. The Large Hadron Collider is just the latest and the biggest. But there's the whole accelerator complex. You can see down at the bottom, LINAC2, that's the start. And so let's talk a little bit about, oh, and by the way, I, I said this last class, but again, one of the reasons I want to talk about the Large Hadron Collider, other than the fact that it's amazing and it represents some of the greatest things we humans are doing right now, it's also a great review, because we have a final coming up in a few days. So it's a great review for things like circular motion and electric fields and stuff. So here's some review for you. We take a bottle of hydrogen, and that bottle is about the size of like, you know, your, I don't know, sorority drink bottle. And all the hydrogen, they'll, all the protons they'll ever collide are in there, and they just take some out. And then hydrogen is the first element, it's just a proton or being orbited by an electron. You, they just subject that to a large electric field. So we know electric fields push and pull on charged particles. So if I take hydrogen and subject that to a strong enough electric field, the proton goes one way and the electron goes the other way. And I, if the electric field's strong enough, I'll ionize that gas. So I have hydrogen gas that I've ionized. I've separated it. I have plasma, just like the sparks that came off the Van de Graaff machine, just like lightning. I have plasma. And in this case, I'm more interested not in the electrical, like not in the electrons, I'm more interested in the protons. So I bleed off those electrons, it's just a current, and I'm left with naked protons. 
That's what we're going to probe the mysteries of the universe with, those protons. So then I take those protons and I subject them to a, an electric field that accelerates them. Again, I can apply a force to a charged particle in an electric field. I can apply a force to a charged particle in an electric field. So all I have to do is hook up some voltage and off those guys go. They actually have a pretty clever system of doing it rather than just like, so LINAC1 and LINAC, well, all of the linear accelerators are maybe, I don't know, 40, 50 feet long. Rather than just have very high voltage at one end and then ground at the other end and just accelerate them constantly, what they do is they have these just series of accelerators that are about, I don't know, a foot or two wide. And the voltage, you can imagine how this works. So a proton will be repelled from a positive. And so the voltage starts here positive, and the protons want to get out of the way. They, but you can imagine, they get to the negative, they're attracted to the negative. They would probably just oscillate around that negative and just hang out there, because that's where they want to stay. So what they do is once the protons get to that negative, they flip the voltage, and then that becomes positive, and the protons are pushed to the next one, and then the voltage is flipped. And that actually happens millions of times a second, and that's why they're called radio frequency cavities, because they happen around radio frequency. They happen in the, in the megahertz range of things. So they happen a, mil, a couple million times a second. So anyway, the, the protons leave LINAC, and they're going about the third of the speed of light, so they're going about 50,000 miles per second already, just by the time they get to the end of that 50 meter tube. Now from that point forward, I've the problem with a linear accelerator is once my protons go past a certain point, that point is not very useful anymore. So I can only use each chunk of my linear accelerator that one time, and off the protons go there to never come back. So now if, if we really want to get protons going, we start building these ring-shaped accelerators. So the biggest one that we had in uh, Chicago, that's a ring-shaped accelerator. The big one we have in Newport News is oval-shaped. and the Large Hadron Collider and the, the couple stages leading up to it are circular because I can have a little accelerator piece and this, they'll go past it 11,000 times a second so I can keep recycling it. Now here's another nice bit of review for us. Things in this universe don't go in circles by themselves. So the linear accelerator, I can just give them a push and they'll go in a straight line. That's what things do. To get anything, including protons, to go in a circle, I need to give it a push. Hopefully we remember that push needs to be centripetal. So I need something to push those protons on that ring. I need to push them centripetally. Fortunately, nature is going to help us out a lot there. Where's my right hand rule? Nature is going to help us out a lot there because as those protons whiz by, all I need is a downward pointing magnetic field. I'm going to use my right hand. They're protons. They're positive. So if my protons are going this way, this way, my protons are going this way and there's a downward pointing magnetic field, those protons will feel a push orthogonal to their velocity. That's the black F up there. And that is a centripetal force. So all I have to do is get it just right and those things will go in a circle. I have to get the magnitude right, you know, the, the strength of my magnetic field right, and those things will go in a circle. So I've got protons going in a straight line. I just have a nice downward pointing magnetic field, and I'll bend them in a circle. I now have centripetal motion just from voltage and current. That's pretty much it. And so just briefly, how do we do that? Well, they're going really fast. And if you remember from when we were talking about circular stuff, how hard I need to push something to keep it going in a circle goes up with the square of velocity. So as these things get going faster and faster, I need a much, much stronger push. And so the amount, as V goes up, the amount of F I need goes up with the square of that. Therefore, the amount of B, magnetic field I need, goes up. And so I need a very, very strong magnetic field. The magnetic field I need is so strong that normal, well, normal magnets definitely wouldn't do it. I couldn't get like enough refrigerator magnets together to do it. And a normal wire to make an electromagnet wouldn't do it either. I would have the whole tunnel would be filled with wire. I couldn't make an electromagnet big enough. So this is only possible due to that weird thing we've been, we were talking about called superconductivity. And so using liquid helium, I cool the magnets down, and I, make, I cool the electromagnets down, and I get superconducting wire. I can jam 14, 15,000 amps into wire like the size of my belt and I can get very, very strong magnetic fields. And that's how we get these things going in a circle. And so using 
So around that ring, uh, I've got a lot. I think uh, maybe like close to 2,000, close to 2,000 15 meter long chunks of magnet, of superconducting magnet. So I take a superconducting magnet, put it right near the beam pipe, and as those protons go by, they bend ever so slightly. And that's the reason, by the way, it's 17 miles around, because I can only bend them so much. I've got the strongest magnets ever made, and they're still only bending them the tiniest bit. And so it would be great if we could make an LHC here in a building, but we can't get them to bend that tightly. And so we have to make it that long, or that's as strong as we can bend them. So then they go spinning around the track. But we've got a couple other things we need to do. Occasionally, we need to accelerate them. So around the track, there's also a couple thousand accelerator uh, sections, and that's just the same as before. It's just an electric field. Electric field pushes on charge. And then here's the other problem. Those protons, they're all positively charged. We know that like charges repel. And so I've got a bunch of protons in a pipe the size of a pencil. They are constantly trying to leave. They're constantly pushing away from one another and trying to go out of the beam pipe. And so actually, every third section of pipe is not a bending or an accelerating. It's a squeezing magnet. And so I've got, that's kind of how, how the whole machine works. It's like sets of three. It goes accelerate, bend, squeeze, accelerate, bend, squeeze, accelerate, bend, squeeze for 17 miles around. So I've got these squeezing magnets that focus the beam down to this very, very tiny point. And then finally, I'm ready to collide them. And so in my four main experiments, ATLAS, ALICE, CMS, uh, CMS, and LHCB, I bring those beams into collision. And so around the 17 miles, it's mostly beam pipe. But then at four places, I get to do the science. And the science is bringing these, these things into collision and seeing what comes out. And we've been doing that at particle detectors for a century now. At the Large Hadron Collider, we've been doing it for almost a decade. And we bring protons into collision. And the goal of that is just to create another Big Bang, lots of them all day long. Big Bang, Big Bang, Big Bang. And we see what nature does with a Big Bang. And that's how we study some of the craziest concepts and ideas and theories of science is, well, let's see what, let's watch the Big Bang happen. The Big Bang happened 14 billion years ago. One way to study that, one way to get to know us and the, na the origins of our universe is to see if we can study the Big Bang. Well, we can't go back in time, but we can recreate the conditions that were present at the Big Bang, and we can watch this unfold. And that's what goes on. That's Atlas. That's the big one. CMS is also very large. You can see two people down there. Pretty big machine. And let's see. Let's pull a picture of a collision. That's a, a collision that happened at CMS. So what happens is you take two protons in, and that is one proton collision. And out of the, out of the debris comes lots of things that didn't go in. And I think that's an important point is that we not, like I said last class, we're not, we're not figuring out what's inside my watch by smashing my watch and just seeing watch parts come out. We're, it's, more, it's more interesting that, than that. We're just using protons to make a bunch of energy at one spot and then seeing what nature does with it. And so out of the collision, nature will send that chart of 17 particles. And the heavier they are, the rarer they are, and the more energetic a collision I need. So that's why we keep building these bigger and bigger machines, is to explore the more rare parts, or the more rare elements that, that, that nature will give us. So we put enough energy into that one spot. Nature occasionally will give us a top quark, occasionally give us a bottom quark. And out of every trillion collisions or so, a Higgs boson comes out. And so we needed to do, so when we finally, when the guys at CERN finally published their paper, said, we found the Higgs boson, that paper was from forget, something like, I think a couple hundred Higgs bosons that had come out of the data. And that couple hundred Higgs bosons, in order to get a couple hundred Higgs bosons, they had to make trillions and trillions and trillions of collisions. And so they're just doing these collisions all day long, and 99.9999% of them just aren't interesting. And not to get too much into it, but there's a computer system there that is looking at all of them going, not interesting, not interesting, not interesting, because we don't have enough computing storage on the planet to store all the data that comes out of CERN. So they rely on these tr computer triggers to go, nope, 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 okay, keeper, nope, nope, keeper. And that's, been, that's, that's going on all day long. Okay, um, so there's a collision from CMS. There's a collision from Atlas. Uh, and so you can see the, and then they use, again, 
they use magnets to also help parse through the, the debris. And so something that goes shooting off into the left through the magnetic field, they know, oh, that was negatively charged. Something that goes curling off to the right, that was positively charged. Something that goes straight that's not deflected by a magnetic field, that is neutrally charged. And so we can figure out their charge, we can figure out their mass, and we can kind of uh, piece together what nature is doing in that instant that the collision happens. Okay. And then you get every now and then you get to have, um, let's see, does that tell me how many there were? No. But then every now and then you get to have a big conference and say, hey, we did it, we found something amazing. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. Percent the speed of light. Yes. Um, Billy asked, why can we go any faster? First of all, you can't go faster than the speed of light. That's just a rule of nature. Einstein predicted it. We're sh pretty sure he's right. And if you have mass, you can't go the speed of light. Um, the equations just tell us that. So if you are mass less, you are bound to go the speed of light. You have no choice. You're going the speed of light. And if you have mass, you can't quite get there. And there's a couple good reasons for that. One. Uh, your mass and your mass actually increases with speed, and so you get heavier. And so it would take infinite energy to get something with mass to the speed of light. So it would take infinite energy. But also, um, interestingly, time slows down as the faster you go. And for light, time comes to a stop. And if we got you going the speed of light, you wouldn't do anything because your time you wouldn't have time. And so when we watch things decay or change in the collider, we, that's actually evidence that some that there there was mass because they had they had time. If they didn't change, if they didn't have time, they wouldn't change. Which actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I was gonna, one other thing I was going to mention real quick. So here's a map of the CERN accelerator complex. Where's? Let's look at that one. Um, yeah, this is uh, I think one other maybe the last point I'll mention about CERN. Then we'll have to talk about a couple other things. Um, so that's the big CERN accelerator complex. LHC is the big one. That's where they're getting all the data. You can you can see kind of shooting off to the right in the middle. There's a, it says CNGS, and there's a little arrow kind of pointing off down that way. Um, the CERN neutrino site of Grand Sasso, that's a CNGS. And then you can also see it in this picture. Um, where, yeah, there's a little pink dotted line going straight down. And then it, that, that pink dotted line says Grand Sasso, parentheses, Italy, 730 kilometers away. And, um, you may have heard a couple of years ago they thought they found that neutrinos are going faster than the speed of light. Turned out there was a loose plug and they fixed it. They keep getting undone by these stupid things. But, um, but the, re the reason I wanted to bring that up, first of all, that broke physics. So they, they, they literally, uh, this is how they measure how fast the neutrinos are going. And I think we should know this. Velocity is the rate of change of time. There's some good review from like the first day of class. A rate of change of position. And so if you want to calculate velocity, you can calculate delta x divided by delta t, change in position divided by change in time. So they took change in position, the, the, the distance from where the neutrinos left CERN and the, their detector 730 kilometers away, so delta x is 730, and they just measured the time. And they had a very, very accurate clock, and they took delta x divided by delta t, and they got a little bit faster than the speed of light, and that just broke physics. That's not allowed to happen, especially for neutrinos, because they change, and you can't change if you have a clock, if you don't have a clock. Um, and so they eventually figured out that the cable was loose, causing the timing to be slightly off, and they fixed it. And they, we now are pretty sure neutrinos don't go to the speed of light, and they have mass. But the other thing that was interesting that I wanted to just point out about that, here's how you get a neutrino from, from CERN to Italy, which is 730 kilometers away. I mentioned this whole experiment is 100 meters underground. And so 730 kilometers, yeah. So if I want to get my neutrinos from CERN to somewhere 730 kilometers away, I don't fortunately have to build a 730 kilometer long tunnel because neutrinos are so weakly interacting with matter, you just point them at Italy and let them go and they'll go through the wall, through Earth, and they'll show up in Italy. And they just pass through all the rock and all the Earth on the, between here in Italy, between CERN and Italy, and they show up in the detectors. And so. LHC ends up being this great neutrino factory, and if you want some, they'll just point their neutrino gun your way, and they'll show up, and they'll just pass through the floor and, us and everything else in between you and there, and they show up. So, um, pretty cool experiment that they're doing there. Okay. 
Let's move on to two other things, and we're going to wrap up for the semester. Um, let's see. One of the things that's going on at I, yeah, one of the things that's going on at CERN, um, I think, serves as a little bit of a warning. Someone a couple classes ago asked, "What about that whole thing that CERN might blow up the world and make a big bang, or make a big a black hole that eats the world, or something like that?" We were pretty sure our our math showed that we we're pretty sure that that was not going to happen, that we're probably not going to make a black hole that ate the world. Yet, it is definitely worth pausing to note we are playing with nature at its most fundamental level. And you and I are here because a Big Bang happened, at least this is the physics narrative, is a Big Bang happened and now we're here. And that all happened by the laws of physics. And we are, right now as we speak, tinkering with those laws of physics, getting down, really down to the fundamental level. And there's a risk there. There's a risk with maybe the hubris involved in that kind of pursuit. And it actually came up in the news a couple days ago. So this is a nice, um, this is a nice segue because I probably wasn't going to talk about this, but it came up in the news the other day. Um, actually, just a couple days ago, you may have heard. Um, this is called, this is called the Drake equation, and I, I couldn't help myself. There's Drake, um, but. This is called the Drake Equation, and it was um, postulated by a guy named Drake uh, in the 1960s. And the equation is back in the news just last few days because a paper came out the other day that revisited this equation. Here's what this equation says. This equation says n is the number of, the number of intelligent civilizations other than us that we might be able to communicate with. That would be nice. It would be nice to be able to communicate with another intelligent civilization, or us intelligent civilization. And here's how you get that number. You start with r, that is the rate. This is the most complicated equation we've seen all semester. Rate of star formation. That's hence the last trick. The rate of star formation. Times the fraction that have planets. Times the number of those that have inhabitable planets. Times the fraction of those that life might develop. So you can see where he's going with this. Okay, we've got all these stars in the galaxy, right? How many of those have life? Well, we can kind of crunch the numbers. You can say, well, how many of those have uh, planets? That's, not, that's a fraction. And so take all those stars in the galaxy. That's a very large number. But then multiply it by a small fraction that is the number that have planets. And multiply that by a small fraction, the ones we think life, that might have the conditions for life. Multiply that by a very small fraction, the number, the, the fraction that might develop intelligent life. Multiply that by a very small fraction, the, those that actually might eventually communicate with us. And then finally, times capital L. Capital L is how long they stuck around. And when Drake wrote this equation, and this is, I think, still a good point, when Drake wrote this equation, what he said was, that last number might be very small. In fact, that last number might be roughly zero. And the reason for that is, in order for us to communicate with another civilization, they need to be doing things like making TV channels and radio channels and satellite signals and cell phones, right? There's no way we're going to see them with the naked eye. The way we're going to detect another species is by their communicating. They are out, they're blasting their cell phone signals and text messages out into the space, and they're traveling at the speed of light, and we might pick them up someday. And just like, careful what you text, that is traveling at the speed of light to the whole universe right now, and someday some civilization is going to pick that up. That's how we're going to get in touch with each other. And here's the warning. The warning is, probably any civilization, by the time they master nature, which is a scary phrase in and of itself, by the time they master nature enough to be able to blast wireless messages is probably the same time they'll kill themselves by either eating up all their resources or blowing themselves up in a thermonuclear war. And so by the time you've figured out nature enough to be able to oscillate an electric field and send it at the speed of light across the planet to, or to a satellite uh, as a radio transmission is probably at the same time you learned, hey, I like my tribe better and I can blow up that tribe with the same power. And so the power that enables us to communicate is the same power that is a little bit risky to wield. And so that's, that's the warning right now for us as a species that right now this is where we are. We're in this stage where we're learning a lot about nature. We should use it for good, not bad, I guess I could say. Um, and so in, let's see, in three minutes, 
I think I want to tell you a little bit about how that works. And by how that works, I mean, so we're learning how stuff works. Here's the three minute, two minute version of how a nuclear bomb works. The way a nuclear bomb works, there's two kinds. There's the kinds that we've already used uh, tragically in our history, and those are called fission weapons, and those create large amounts of energy by fission. And fission is how the nuclear power plant that powers, that probably powers this building works. And we're, we're pretty familiar with that. And we can take large amounts of like uranium and plutonium, these big heavy elements, these big heavy elements, and split them. And when they split into lighter elements, they give up some of that energy equals mc squared. It can be a lot. And so what we can do is we can enrich uranium, take a lot of uranium, put it into a big bomb, and then I can drop that bomb wherever I want it to go, and I can inject that bomb with some. I can inject that bomb with a source. So the, the uranium-235, which I think is the one that's in there, is very unstable. It kind of is a just about to split into lighter elements. But it needs sort of a kick. And that kick is I can inject some neutrons, neutrons into that, into that uranium-235, and it'll split. And the way it works is when it splits, it shoots off some more neutrons, which then split its neighbors. And there's a chain reaction that occurs very rapidly. And so all of the energy of that splitting a lot of it goes into heat and light, but a lot of it goes into kicking off the further reactions of its neighbors. So the way a nuclear reaction works is a nuclear chain reaction. And so if you've ever heard the term atomic bomb, or let's see, not hydrogen bomb, I forget the other phrase that's often used, but yeah, the A-bomb, that's what's going on, is there's this chain reaction going on. And my one demo for the day is a demo of a chain reaction. Um, and that's one of the reasons. I hate that picture. I don't want to be talking much about bombs. But I did want to do this demo. So that's one of the reasons we're talking about it today. Um, and so I have up here a chain reaction. So what I can do is I can inject one neutron. And that neutron, that neutron will cause one of the uranium atoms to split. It'll hit one of them. It'll split, sending out two other neutrons. Those two neutrons will then hit something and split into four. And you can see this reaction goes exponentially. And eventually, I will have all of my uranium blown up. I will have all that energy released. And so right now, uh, the, energy that's in the, the energy that gets released is mass, actually, in a bomb. And here, it's stored as spring potential energy. So somebody had to do work. Here's a little review for you. Somebody had to do work to add energy to each one of those springs, and now they're ready to release that energy. And it'll be released as kinetic energy of the balls. So let's give it a shot. I'm going to zoom in. I don't want to miss it. So it should just need, I should just need one neutron. I should just need one neutron. And I'll probably miss the first time. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> There it is. That's, that's the final bang for this class. Um, and I think I've I think I've depleted I think I've depleted all my uranium, all in one in one shot. And now I would have to enrich my uranium in order to run that again. And we're not we don't have time to do that. Okay. We have ten minutes left. Here's my last ten minutes for you guys for this semester. Good luck. Yep. Competition. It happens. Okay. Um, here's my last, in 10 minutes, here's my last comments for you guys. That uh, all semester, I've gotten to know a surprising number of you, which I thought was awesome. There's like 250 people in here. I've gotten to know bunches. A lot of people have been pretty proactive about coming to office hours or just seeking me after class. So I, I've appreciated that. And I've gotten to know that most of you guys are not physics majors, and most of you guys are going to go off and do amazing things in the world of nursing or art or whatever you guys your major is. And so I want to just reiterate something I said on the first day of class, and that's why do you take a class called How Things Work? Why do you study physics? Why do you not just leave that to the physicists? And I think there's, I'll give you three reasons. I'll give you three reasons why I think everyone should study physics. Everyone should want to know how things work. Reason number one, reason number one, I'm gonna, I'll call perspective, and that is just about anything you've studied. One way to think of something you've studied is 
it's a some it's a something that can challenge your perspective and give you a, a new way of looking at your limitations, a new way of looking at the species. And I think one of the things that science has done, which is vastly important, is we put a camera on the moon. And so for the first time in the history of our species, we could see ourselves from afar. And I think that is a very important thing. And so what science can enable you to do is to look at yourself in a different way, to look at yourself in a different light. And so when we look at the very, very, very small, and we realize we're made of atoms, and those atoms are made of things, and those things are very difficult to understand, that is an important thing for all of us to do, is to challenge the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at our place in the universe. There's a picture taken from the moon. You may have heard of the pale blue dot. That's a pretty famous photograph taken in the 90s. And it's a great story that Carl Sagan, so we had the Voyager 1 spacecraft, and we had sent it out at like 50,000 miles an hour, buzzing through the, through the uh, solar system. And its job was to take pictures and study the planets as it left the solar system. So it passed all the planets, and it passed Saturn and Jupiter, and that was its last job. And it beamed back some important data back to us. And that was it. And the, the, its, job, its job was over. And so we were just going to let it go off into the, into the galaxy forever. And so Carl Sagan, one of the great science communicators at the time, said, let's do this. I know this is not part of its official mission. Let's see if we can get it to turn around and take basically the coolest selfie ever. Let's see if we can get it to turn around and take a shot back at us. And that white dot is us. And at the time, again, no one had ever seen us from such, I think, a humbling perspective, that we were just this dot floating in the cosmos. And I think that's an important perspective to, at least in your whole life, spend five minutes going, what? That's crazy. And so if you ever get a chance, read Carl Sagan's uh, thoughts on that. He's very eloquent. And he, he encourages you to think about just how, when you look at you know, our planet from that perspective, how nuts it seems you know, to kill it. He says something like, to be killing each other over a fraction of a pixel. Uh, you know, one inhabitant of one side of that pixel, you know, freaking out about the other inhabitants on the other side of the pixel. It's just, I think it, it, it's, it's a good perspective to have. And so I think science provides that. And like I said, just about, that's one way to think of so many of the things that we study. And so when we study, um, when we study art, when we study religion, like that's kind of an important thing to do is it causes us to, to think in a new way about ourselves. And that, I mean, hopefully you've read a book and seen a movie and listened to a song that did that. You're like, what? That really messes with my worldview. And that's, science can do that, which I, I, I appreciate. Um, another thing I wanted to mention before we're, two more things before we head out. Um, I'll, I'll have to do an eye clicker at some point. I could, yeah, I could skip it today. Um, I'll, might do, I'll do one at the end. Um, bef before, we, before we head out, here's another one that I think is a, is a big one. And I've stood here a grand total this semester of probably going on 30, 40 hours of talking and my ego likes to sound like I know what I'm talking about. I think it's important to know that none of your professors know what they're talking about. And scientists in particular don't know what they're talking about. And so, like I said, my ego wants to say, yeah, that's, this is the way it is. Scientists li dwell in uncertainty. That is actually, actually, ever since a guy named Werner Heisenberg came up with the uncertainty principle, it's now actually embedded in our actual understanding of the universe, that there is, not, there is no certainty. Um, I think Newton, Newton was on a path to figure out if we just got the right equations, we would know everything. We would know how the universe worked. We now live, and this is an important understanding, we now live in a, in a period where science tells us we'll never know. We have to be okay with that. And we have to understand that we can never pin down nature. It's just, it, it literally, we've kind of proven that it won't be, we've kind of shown that it can't be shown how it works. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the picture that we have right now. And, and again, as a scientist, I think that's very important. It kind of um, erodes dogma. It kind of protects you from dogma. It protects you from this idea that I know what's up and everyone else is wrong. I just think that has never been a healthy outlook. And so science in the last century has kind of given us a scientific reason to doubt that kind of thinking, to say, no, there is uncertainty. And so I've always thought that one of those false dichotomies is that the opposite 
of faith is doubt and that science is trying to get us to this place of ridding doubt. And that's just not the world we live in. And science, in fact, is just giving us the opposite, showing us that uncertainty is something we have to be comfortable with. And I, I, that's, I think that's a healthy perspective. And then the last thing, um, I, I already said the first day of class, and that is, here's the last reason you should study physics and want to know how things work and why know, want to know why, I don't know, probably all your studies, and that is, there is, it's in, science and physics will just enrich your time in this world. And so the more you know, if you know all the intricacies of how a rainbow works, that doesn't diminish rainbows, it doesn't make them any less beautiful. I think the more you know about the world, the more you have accessed the world, the better your time will be. And so if you have, you spend time as a scientist, that gives you a very rich look at the world. It's not complete. And that's why any good scientist is also reading fiction and doing other things to broaden their perspective. And so um, I want us to, if, if, this, if this is your last science class, I hope there's a little bit of curiosity about some of the things that science is going to continue to do. So for 50 years, when you're flipping the newspaper, 50 years from now, you're flipping the paper and you see that scientists did something, you're like, ah, I don't want to know about that. Read that article. They're probably doing something really cool that might change your perspective about the world, that might unsettle you a little bit, and that's a good thing. Okay. Um, I, should I do an eye clicker? I, we, yes? Okay, fine. <laughs> Lindsay says yes, so um, sure. Um, I don't know which one. Um, let's see. As uh, let's do. I don't know. Let's. I that that one. That one. Sure. Look at you guys, geniuses. This is great. Everyone's getting it right. Well, 37 of us think they're going at constant speed, so they're not accelerating. It, they are accelerating because taking a left counts as accelerating. Their acceleration is centripetal. All right, we'll call six. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck on the rest of your exams.